So what do you say to this? Makerspaces really are full of 20-somethings who are middle class and educated and either have done design or arts degrees and so are well equipped to be creative anyway or they're just remedial centres for kids who've not had that experience in school because it's being driven out. Are those two true? I mean, we do get quite a lot of, like we get octogenarians. I mean, I think that the user base it was, was the surprising thing for us, really, is that it was everything from kids who were really keen on technology and really wanted to kind of push things forward and, and not understand just how to use the machines to make, but understand how the machines worked and pull them apart and learn, um, to people who wanted to just... Um, be creative, but didn't maybe have the hands-on skills. And, and this, you know, the, the technology enabled, and this is one big movement that's happened, is the technology has enabled people who might have creative thinking, but didn't have the physical dexterity to be able to make things with their hands, or turn, or use a lathe, or whatever, who can now actually design something on a computer and 3D print it. Um, and, but we also get people who maybe have retired and used to work on submarines and things like that, and, and used to work on the tools and back in the day, and they want to come back and, and, and learn these new techniques and are really interested in how things are made, regardless whether it is 60 years ago or now. Um, and I think it, it's, it's the whole spectrum. And I know that sounds like a kind of a catch-all, but mm. we literally do get it from, from very young age to very old age, and creative people, people who may not do well academically in school, but kind of really like making stuff to those who are doing well academically, academically in school and want to investigate more. So it's, it's the full range. You it's warm the cockles with the I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there are close to 3,000 makerspaces now around the world, probably a bit more, and probably another 1,000 in uh, lots of uh, real estate plants that are going to be scratched out soon because they found out it's difficult. Um, but the, in these 3,000 makerspaces, there are places, and when they are focused on uh, and they understand the community they're working for, they are very different. And this is a makerspace that is focusing on teaching teachers to bring makerspaces or making into schools in India around rural farming. This is a makerspace in Barcelona that is focusing on circular economy. This is a makerspace um, in a refugee uh, camp, which is only for uh, young women who are interested in engineering and sciences. So when a makerspace really understands its mission, it can do very different things than the, what you described, but they are still, I'd say, a minority of the makerspace that understand how to really focus on their mission and their identity. Um, but in terms of what they could do, they could also you know, really uh, teach employability. And this is a makerspace in uh, um, Cape Town that has a great program where they teach a skill together with an attitude. So, like, they teach printing together with communication. They, they, pr they teach shoemaking together with reliability. And when the person then finishes this 10-skill course, they make things and they are able to talk to future employers about their skill, but also about the attitudes that these skills have taught them. So I think these are the programs, and the programs can migrate between the spaces. I think you, it's true, though, what you say. And we know that from the kind of the Nesta open data set that I put together with Andrew Slee on makerspaces in the UK, there is a massive gender disparity. There is a massive demographic disparity. And it comes down to kind of, if you are working in a minimum wage job, nine till five or more than nine till five, you don't have time to be going to any makerspaces. And then there's a self-awareness question that's quite significant within makerspaces themselves, particularly related to the gender side of things, but also anyone who feels vulnerable walking around at night on industrial estates. We're told constantly from a young age that you don't, as a female, walk around at night on industrial estates with no good lighting, but the open evenings for many spaces are on industrial estates, and they're kind of at 7 o'clock in the evening. So there's a few kind of design features and affordances of spaces in the way they're put together now that does privilege a certain type of person yeah. and a certain type of participation. And I think you're right that these programs and things like the Maker Library Network things like Maker Assembly, um, function as a way of getting the self-awareness into the 
spaces and getting the self-awareness so that we can design things better. But it's part of a, sto a, full, a bigger story of a city and mm -hmm. how, you know, um, I live and work in uh, South London and Brixton. It's overgone a complete change of the public space than uh, young women sitting with their laptops in the afternoon, evening, uh, in an area that used to be kind of uh, frightening for us to cross through uh, at late. Um, it's changed, but it wasn't that someone said, okay, that's, we're gonna change that section. It's a much more holistic uh, relationship with the, with the employment and relationship with uh, keeping some of the, not the, keeping a tabs on the, re on really good principles for regeneration. Yeah. Um, and so it, the, the food market there has completely changed with lots of places to eat, but there was a principle that no chain could take a space there. It had mm -hmm. to be someone independent starting their own place. So these kind of, that's kind of beginning to be policy. Yeah. Or at least DNA that people agree to follow. And I think making and makerspaces should be part of that. They're definitely not the main thing in it, but they could support improving uh, safety. Yeah. And again, I think that the, the, the type of makerspace, is, there's such a variety of type of makerspace from, I mean, there are kind of hack spaces that are people with like minds and like, and like interests who get together to do things together. Um, where you've got like Fab Labs, which are much more of an outreach program. So most Fab Labs in the country are open Fridays and Saturdays um, during the day, and, and, and some of them during the evening. But to try and kind of, and most of them are free of charge to use as well during those days, so that you do try and minimize. I mean, one of, the, one of the whole points of the Fab Lab movement is to try and minimize the barriers to accessing this kind of equipment. So, yeah, bearing in mind all of the, you know, the, 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 the nighttime concerns and that stuff. I mean, and we have the same for our staff. You know, we don't want our staff wandering around on their own at that time of night in industrial estates either. Um, but also that the demographic is interesting because one of the surprises I, I certainly saw at Fab Lab Manchester and, and even now coming into the making rooms is that we do get quite a balance of gender, male and female, coming into the lab and using the space because it's not what I expected when we first launched it. It would be all geeky techs coming in and making kind of gizmos mm -hmm. and gadgets and electronic stuff. It's most, most of the people we get in are, are creative and, and, and creating artworks and, and design furniture and like that. So it's, it's, it's very much a balance of, 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 of gender and, and age. I wonder the confidence to go somewhere, sorry. We've got another question there that I want to just kind of ask, where are we drawing the edges? as far as making, oh, is coding making? Is everyone learning how to make things digitally? Is that still making? Does that still do the same thing? And do you have, is that kind of, is Fixbooks looking at the full gamut of that? Uh, Fixbooks is looking at creative problem solving and you can use a tape for that and you can use coding. You can use um, uh, reorganizing something and you can use uh, 3D printing. That's the, the thing is to, to have the confidence to have a go at really quickly trying something. Yeah. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. We see all these tools of solving problems as part of this making mindset. Brilliant. Mm. 